We've done Disney, we've done DreamWorks, and we've done Pixar. Naturally, the next studio in line for the Squid Game treatment would be Sony Animation. After all, their villains are fun, entertaining, and even intimidating when they want to be. So why not see how their skills would compare against each other? I'm Caleb with Wicked Binge, and I'm here to tell you which Sony Animation villain would win Squid Game. Much like Pixar, you may be seeing a few, let's just say out there, contestants due to how unique Sony's villain lineup is. But as always, we're going to try to make things as fair as possible, which means no superpowers, gadgets, or weapons. With that detail out of the way, our contestants are Tank, Shaw, Chef Quasimodo, Mayor Shelbourne, Bella, Smiler, Black Bellamy, Queen Victoria, Chester V, King Leonard Mudbeard, Zeta, Erica Van Helsing, Abraham Van Helsing, Gargamel from Smurfs The Lost Village, The Royal Hunter, Pockets, Doc Ock, The Prowler, Kingpin, Pal, and Lutador for a total of 21 contestants. As always, we'll start with our first game, Red Light Green Light. Red Light Green Light is a game that's all about speed and sharp listening skills. The goal is to make it to the finish line as fast as you can. However, if a player is too focused on the finish line to realize when a red light is coming up, or if they easily panic and accidentally move or stumble when they're supposed to freeze, this game could spell their doom. Someone who does extremely well in this game is Erica, as we've seen just how acrobatic she can be. Similarly, Pockets, who is pretty much a master with his feet, would do very well. The Prowler, aka Aaron Davis, is also incredibly agile. Additionally, as an assassin and mercenary, he's a great listener too. Finally, as a hunter, the royal hunter would be able to move quickly while also keeping an ear out for instructions. Looking at those who wouldn't do so well in this game, we unfortunately have to get rid of our most recent Sony villain, Pal, right off the bat. As much as we may love her, without her robots, she's just a smartphone. Given that she isn't allowed to have these robots with her in the game, Pal quickly ends up with a bullet through her screen. Someone else who would have a hard time in this game would be Abraham Van Helsing. He may have had a good chance of passing when he was younger, but with how slow his new robotic body is, we just can't see him crossing the finish line in time. That is, if the gears in his body are even able to freeze in time with the red lights. The only other death in this game is Shaw. While yes, we're sure that he'd be a decent listener since he's another character who's a hunter, we have to remember that the guy is kind of insane. This combined with his paranoia makes him just unstable enough to likely panic during this intense game. With 18 of our villains surviving, it's time for our next game, Papagi or Honeycomb. The Honeycomb game requires patience and a steady hand. Too much shaking or pressure could cause a fatal break. As such, our contestants will need to have enough focus to poke out their shape without accidentally breaking it. While pirates aren't exactly known for a gentle touch, we think that Black Bellamy would do well in this game. He's a chill dude and, as a pirate, probably has a pretty steady hand when it comes to things like knives and cutlasses too, so we think he'd be able to pass this round. As an inventor, we feel that Chester V would also have a steady hand in this game, as well as a ton of patience. The same could be said for scientist and villainous extraordinaire Doc Ock. Another character with an insane amount of patience would be Smiler. After all, her whole thing is staying happy. And we also see her use small dentistry tools to keep her teeth clean, so we know she has a steady hand too. Unfortunately, we can't say that Ludador doesn't share this same success. Like Pal before him, this death is kind of unfair since as a snake, Ludador doesn't exactly have hands. But hey, them's the breaks. Another character that gets screwed over by their biology is Tank. 
Penguin flippers aren't exactly super steady or careful, nor would they likely be able to grip a needle very well. This, combined with Tank's additional strength and below average intelligence, spells his doom. We also have to say goodbye to Kingpin. Yeah, we're sure this one hurts, but with how insanely strong this guy is and how big his hands are, we just don't think he would be able to pass this one, no matter how much patience he may have. Finally, due to Bella's intense anger issues and reckless nature, we felt that he would also die in this game. Looking at our remaining contestants, we're left with 14 Sony Animation baddies still standing. Following the Honeycomb game, we of course have the Midnight Brawl. Lack of food and sleep plus the stress of staying alive can drive any person to the point of violence, and in these games, it's every contestant for themselves. To survive this game, a person must be either strong enough to fight or clever and sneaky enough to hide. So, who would be able to either fend off attackers or properly hide themselves until the brawl was over? Just like in the first round, we see Erica, Pockets, and Aaron all do extremely well, as all of them are very skilled combatants and could easily fight off anyone who tries to cross them. Though Chester V is more brain than brawn, his intelligence and strange flexibility would definitely help his stealth, allowing him to sneak through this game unscathed. Though he may have a bit of a height disadvantage, Chef Quasimodo showed in the first movie. Another big winner in this round is Her Majesty Queen Victoria. Despite the royal stereotype, Vicky is actually surprisingly adept with a pair of katanas. And although she can't use weapons in the games, we still feel like she'd be able to kick some ass. We can't, however, say the same for Mayor Shelbourne. Not only is he lacking in the strength department, but the guy's a bit of a coward, often bailing or blaming others when he senses trouble. But while he is sneaky, considering that this is the guy who ate his escape boat, we don't think that he's smart enough to find a good hiding spot either. See ya, suckers! Keeping with the theme of incompetent leaders, Leonard also falls in this game. Though he may be greedy and charismatic, he can also be pretty dim-witted and can't quite outmatch the other characters in this game. The final death in this game is the wizard Gargamel. Though he may be a decently skilled wizard and alchemist, without his magic powers, he just doesn't stand much of a chance. With several more contestants permanently down for the count and 11 villains still left standing, it's time for another strength-based game, Tug of War. Unlike the actual Squid Game, we aren't going to assign characters to specific teams. Instead, we're simply going to judge them based on their abilities and likelihood to survive. To win Tug of War, you don't just need strength, you also need strategy and a willingness to work with others. Even weaker players have a shot at surviving if they can coordinate properly with stronger players. As a captain, Black Bellamy already knows how to lead a crew or a team, and that combined with his decent strength makes him a shoe-in for this game. Aaron is pretty strong on his own, and given that we see him work alongside several other Spider-Man baddies in Spider-Verse, we feel that he would also be able to work in a team well. Given that she studied physics while in school, we think that Zeta would actually be able to come up with an effective strategy for this game. We also have to take into account her status as a leader, also very helpful in a game like Tug of War. We see throughout the second Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs movie that Chester V is often commanding his army of holograms. This mix with his genius intellect would make him a great team leader for this game. Good thing too, otherwise this string bean wouldn't have stood a chance. Finally, as much as she may want to be in charge, Queen Vicky is still a diplomat of sorts and wouldn't be prideful enough to ignore her team's input as long as following their lead meant saving her own skin. One character who does fall in this game, however, is Pockets. And no, that isn't because of the whole hands in his pockets thing, we're sure that he'd take them out for this game. 
Pockets is, however, incredibly self-absorbed, and this pride and greediness can make him act foolish. We just don't see him meshing well with his team. We should also point out how isolated the Royal Hunter can be, only being loyal to King Herod and how this is ultimately his biggest failing in a team-focused game like this one. He was even willing to let his own dogs die to try and save his skin. While he may be decently strong, we've run through the tug-of-war scenario enough to know that strength isn't everything. It can still matter, however, which is why the final death of the game is Quasimodo. Yes, he may have experience with ropes being a bell ringer and all, but there's a big difference between pulling on a bell and pulling against a team, and his short height probably doesn't help much either. With another game done and over with, we're left with eight contestants. Up next, we have the Marble Game. Marbles is an interesting one, at least in the context of Squid Game. There are multiple ways for pairs of players to play their marble game. They could focus on accuracy or how far they can roll their marble, or they can simply guess how many marbles are in their opponent's hand. As such, there are multiple ways to win, with most of these ways relying on either skill or luck. Of course, if you don't have the skills to win, there's always manipulation. Again, both Queen Victoria and Chester V really shine here, as both of them have been shown to be great manipulators. With Vicky managing to persuade the pirate captain to part with Polly and Chester V turning flint against his friends. Doc Ock is a very patient and intelligent woman, and given how she was able to get Peter B to let his guard down around her, we think she would do just fine in this game. Our other remaining Spidey villain also does well, though not necessarily because he's a manipulator. Again, Aaron is an assassin, so he's probably used to noticing small details and successfully hitting targets. So, when it comes to the actual game of marbles, he wins easily. Similarly, Zeta's knowledge of physics once again comes in handy in this game. What, you never heard of Thermal? Even if she isn't too manipulative, you don't really need to be if you can play the game near perfectly. Unfortunately, after making it farther than we would have expected, it's finally time to say so long to Black Bellamy. Though it may have saved him in the honeycomb, this is where Bellamy's chill nature comes back to bite him. Even if Bellamy can be mischievous and a bully when he wants to be, it just can't compare to our other finalists. Another fan favorite, Erica also falls in this game. We saw throughout the third movie that Erica can sometimes let her anger and impatience get the better of her, causing her to fail at assassinating Drac. She was also pretty unobservant when it came to the booby traps in Atlantis, and being unobservant in this game is pretty much a death sentence. Our final death of this game is Smiler. While she is essentially the leader of the phone, Smiler is more a bossy dictator than an outright manipulator. She may put on a happy persona, but like with Bellamy, we just don't think that goes very far when put up against the other baddies. We're now officially down to our final five, and just in time for one of this competition's deadliest games, Glass Stepping Stones. This game is another tricky one for a hypothetical scenario, as much of this game relies on luck. There is one strategy to it, however, that being the advantage of going last after some glass pieces have already been broken. As such, those who have a big enough ego to want to try a game first will likely seal their doom. Naturally, as queen, Victoria would probably insist on going first. If not, just shove people out of the way so she could go first. So, it's no surprise that she dies in this game. The next person to die would likely be Chester V. Given his intelligence and his ability to play to his advantage, we feel at this point Chester V would be feeling pretty confident and untouchable. But unless you have supervision, you can't exactly outwit Glass. And since he would be one of the first to go, Chester wouldn't be able to follow the path of others. Our final death is the sassy bird, Zeta. It really is a shame that Zeta isn't allowed to just use her wings, otherwise this game would be a breeze for her. Outside of that, we also felt her ego would be big enough for her to pick a middle to high number, sealing her fate. 
Just like in the show, our final challenge will be a one-on-one -on -one duel in the titular Squid Game. In this game, two opponents must go up against one another with one acting as defender and the other as an attacker. With the attacker doing everything they can to reach the top of the court or the squid's head and touch it with their foot, with the defender doing whatever they can to stop them. Or at least that's how Squid Game is traditionally played. Here though, it's more of a battle to the death type of deal. This time around, it's a battle of the Spider-Man villains it would seem. Doc Ock versus the Prowler. As such, this is even more of a close call than it usually is. Both villains are pretty tough and know how to fight, even without their weapons or gadgets. Aaron is a bit stronger physically, while Doc Ock takes an advantage in the intelligence department. Ultimately though, we decided that Doc Ock would be the one most likely to die in this game. Aaron was the Kingpin's top hitman, and is agile and a master in combat while also having great endurance and durability. Olivia may have superhuman strength and speed with her tentacles, but without them, she's just an ordinary woman with an above average brain. We aren't saying she can't still fight without her tentacles, but we don't think that she would last as long as Aaron could. Her only saving grace would be if she could figure out a winning strategy, but even then, considering Aaron was an assassin that kills people for a living, we don't think she'd have much of a chance to enact one in time. So, in the end, it's the Prowler who's walking away with the cash. This win may be a bit controversial since it could be argued whether or not the Prowler was a true villain, despite all that he did considering that he sacrificed himself for Miles. But hey, all the more reason to be happy that he did win. But let us know in the comment section if you agree with our ranking, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.